Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Al Dente Creepypasta. Horror stories cooked to perfection with a splash of red sauce. My name is CZ, and I will be your server this episode. Before I get into the menu, let me tell you a little bit about this series. Al Dente Creepypasta will feature quality narrations of completely original stories that you won't find anywhere else. Each tale will be presented with chill-inducing sound design and original music compositions for a production value that will go unparalleled on YouTube. These stories are longer than what you're used to on CZ's World. Feel free to listen to them at work, while getting stuff done around the house, in the car, or if you're feeling brave as you fall asleep at night. Today you'll be getting a three-course meal with a the theme of Halloween horror stories. I know you're hungry, so let's dig right in. 1. The Forbidden House This is a story that happened several years back when trick-or-treating with my friend Alex, my older brother John, and his friend Evan. Every neighborhood has that one house that nobody ever wants to trick-or-treat at. Whether it be because of bad candy, mean owners, a dentist house, fear, or otherwise. In this case, our parents had told us that we could go off on our own this year, as long as we stayed together and agreed not to go to that house. I was in fourth grade that year, and the idea of getting to go off on our own was exciting to me at the time, so naturally, I agreed. When Alex and Evan got to our house, we waited around and answered the door for a while, trying to scare some of the younger trick-or-treaters. Eventually, after our parents took our baby sister to some of the houses, we grabbed our pillowcases and set off to get some candy. We lived in a pretty safe neighborhood, so it was common for kids our age, or even younger, to go out alone. Looking back now, I had grown up in a borderline pretentious suburban neighborhood, the type of community you'd see in movies like Donnie Darko or American Beauty. Almost everyone in our neighborhood had decorations, and those who didn't had these decorative wooden ghosts nailed to the side of their mailbox. They were more of a cutesy decoration than scary, but they did give a nice uniformity to all the houses in the neighborhood. It was starting to get dark when we reached the house that our parents told us not to go to. This wasn't your stereotypical dark manor at the end of the block, but it was a little further away from the street than many of the other houses, and sort of tucked back behind some trees. I suggested that we go back to our house to dump whatever candy we had off before hitting up another neighborhood, but John and the others were curious to see what the big deal was about the dark house. I'll have to admit, I was quite curious about why my parents didn't want us going over there, and it did seem harmless enough, so I figured they would have no way of knowing if we quickly hit this house. The driveway was long and dark, and there was no light coming from the house whatsoever. This was one of those houses where the front door was more on the side of the house, with a curved path leading back up to the front. I noticed that this house did not have the wood ghost attached to the mailbox like every other house in the neighborhood. As we walked up, I was starting to get a little nervous, and I told John that I didn't think anyone was home, but he thought I was just trying to chicken out and continued on anyways. We reached the house, and John loudly banged on the door. It was taking forever, and I was fairly convinced that the guy wasn't home or didn't want to deal with trick-or-treaters. Just when I was ready to turn and give up on the house, we all fell silent as the sound of footsteps could be heard on the other side of the door. While this did make me nervous, I was also excited to see what was on the other side of the door that made my parents so worried about this house. So I stepped back a little bit, giving myself some room to run, if need be. The door opened, revealing an older man with a cane. This immediately alleviated some of my anxiety, as it would be pretty easy to run if need be. The man was actually very nice and told us that we were the first visitors of the night and that he didn't expect to see many trick-or-treaters this year. Apparently, he lived alone and had had some kind of dispute with the Neighborhood Homeowners Association over the upkeep of his property, so many of the adults were trying to get back at him by excluding him from all the neighborhood festivities. He seemed like such a nice guy, and we actually felt pretty bad for him. We all wished him a happy Halloween before going on our way. I had felt silly about being nervous about visiting this house, at least. That's how I felt before what happened next. As we walked down the path back to the street side of the house, I happened to glance at the upstairs window and saw a man in a black hood peeking out from behind the window frame. As soon as I made eye contact with him, he moved back out of sight, 
my stomach immediately dropped, as the man had just said that he lived alone. I bolted as I told the guys to run, but John and Evan seemed convinced that I was just being a baby. I tried to quickly tell them that there was a man in the window, but I don't think they believed me. However, John, being the older of the two of us, was supposed to keep an eye on me, so when I made a mad dash back towards our house, he effectively gave chase. I knew in the back of my mind that, although the old man may not have been mobile, that this other guy was most likely a fully capable adult who probably would be able to catch us, so I didn't stop until I was inside the door. My parents had just returned from taking my sister out for a round of the neighborhood, and they could immediately see that there was something wrong. Not wanting to get in trouble for disobeying them, I lied and told them that we were walking by the house when I saw a man in black climbing through the window of the old man's house, and that he had seen us catching him in the act. Apparently, this was a pretty good cover story, as it was enough to get my mom to call the cops and the four of us locked inside the house for the rest of the night. The other guys were pretty bummed out to have our trick-or-treating cut short, and we decided we'd watch a movie and begin trade negotiations on our candy a little early this year. I had a hard time paying attention to the movie and kept looking back to the window, thinking about what the possibility might be that the guy tracked us here. Not much later that night, we learned that the police had searched the old man's house and found a 19-year-old man hiding in the closet with a knife. Apparently, the intruder had no idea who lived there and decided to break in after seeing the house was completely dark and being avoided by trick-or-treaters on Halloween night. The old man was also unharmed, but years later, I still shudder to think about what could have gone down that night. What if I had seen the intruder on the way up to the house before learning that the old man lived alone? What if the intruder had been on the first floor and decided to give chase to us? But what chills me the most is what would have happened to that nice old man if we had never trick-or-treated at his house. Two, the Scarecrow. I'll always remember 7th grade Halloween as one of the last good, innocent years of trick-or-treating with my friends before the paradigm shift to haunted houses, parties, slutty costumes, boys, and alcohol. I'll also remember it, though, for one other reason that I haven't been able to erase from my mind since that night. I remember that day. It was Friday, so almost everyone wore their costumes to school. Jane, Margaret, and I had decided to go as the Powerpuff Girls, even though the show was a long since irrelevant at the time. Jane was Bubbles, Margaret went as Buttercup, and I, being the only one without the correct hair color, wore a red wig to become Blossom. During homeroom, everyone was showing off their costumes. One of our guy friends, Chris, was the only one who didn't wear his costume to school. Chris was one of the more popular guys that we knew, so I found it kind of strange that he hadn't dressed up. When Margaret asked him why he didn't wear a costume, he just told us that we'd have to stop by his place tonight if we wanted to see his costume. We got the idea that whatever he was wearing was obviously too graphic to be brought to school and made plans to swing by and check it out sometime that evening. By the time we made it to Chris's house, it was starting to get pretty late, and I figured we had about an hour or so of trick-or-treating left before we had to call it a night. We were a bigger group of girls now, probably six or seven of us, all in costume. His house didn't seem to have much in terms of decoration, just a few of those Halloween store cobwebs you see on the porch, and a scarecrow sitting on the bench near the front door. Someone rang the bell and Chris's mom showed up, dressed in regular clothes with a witch hat, which I'm pretty sure she wore on multiple years. As we picked out candy, Margaret asked if Chris was home, but his mom told us that he had gone out to scare some trick-or-treaters with a couple friends. I was the last one in line to take a piece of candy, so I thanked her, and we went on our way. As we walked back to the sidewalk, I felt something behind me tug on my wig, pulling it off my head a little bit. I looked back and screamed when I saw the scarecrow standing just a couple inches behind me. A couple of the girls let out screams as well when they turned around and noticed the scarecrow had moved from the bench and snuck up behind us. Margaret seemed to be the first one to come to realization that it was Chris, who had dressed up and waited for us inside the scarecrow. When Jane asked how long he had to wait there, he didn't say anything, and just stared at us, which admittedly made me a little bit uncomfortable, but I tried not to show it, not wanting to give the known prankster any satisfaction. I guess he didn't want to break character, because even as we invited him to come trick-or-treat at a few more houses, he remained silent for the rest of the time. Jane and I poked fun at him, trying too hard to be Mr. Creepy Mysterious, trying to get him to crack or laugh or something. 
but it didn't work. He just followed us from house to house for another block or so until we all decided to go back to my house and hang out for a while. He would occasionally tug on my wig, but I tried not to react, because I knew that was exactly what he wanted. So, we stayed up late seeing as how tomorrow was a Saturday, and we could sleep in as long as we wanted. One of the girls went home, but the rest of us, and Chris, stayed up to watch a scary movie, which ended up not being so scary. Chris didn't even seem to want to watch the movie, he just stared at us the entire time. I knew he was just trying to freak me out, so I ignored him and tried to pay attention to the movie. I was bored and fell asleep about 20 minutes in. When I woke up, it was around 3 in the morning and everyone else passed out on the couch. Chris, however, was gone. I figured that he wouldn't be able to mess with us anymore and walked home. When we got back to school on Monday, we confronted Chris about his little stunt on Halloween. He got this confused expression on his face and told us that his family didn't own a scarecrow or a scarecrow costume and that he had been out all evening trick-or-treating with his friends. He even showed us a picture of his group, with him wearing a Jeff the Killer costume. He seemed to have no idea what we were talking about when we brought up the scarecrow. A couple of his friends even served as his alibis, saying that they were with Chris the entire night. To this day, I don't know if this was an elaborate prank, or if some stranger actually followed us around all night. But what really bothers me most to think about is the possibility that this guy came into my house and after all of us were asleep, left without taking anything or saying a word. I've never seen that particular scarecrow costume again and to this day, I've never gotten Chris to admit that he was behind it. Number three, costume shop. I know Halloween is supposed to be a spooky holiday, but my first Halloween experience left me with scars and nightmares for years to come. Having moved to the USA when I was 17, I had never actually celebrated Halloween before because it wasn't even a known holiday in my home country. A few years later, when I got my first job as a computer consultant, I wanted to do whatever I could to get ahead and move up in the company. When my boss mentioned that there would be a company Halloween party, I saw this as an opportunity to impress by finding the best costume in the office. I wanted to avoid the cheap quality of pop-up Halloween stores, so I found a nice costume rental shop with some supposedly higher quality wares. I headed over there after staying late at work that night. It was pretty far away in the middle of nowhere, but I was hoping it would be worth the extra miles. I got in there about an hour before close, but to my surprise, the place was pretty much empty. There was only one customer in there, despite the fact that we were already pretty late into October. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to go as, so the owner of the store helped me pick out several costumes that I was interested in and let me into the changing room to see how they all looked on me. I started to get undressed when I heard the door chime, signaling that someone was entering or leaving. This was a fairly large shop, but it was small enough that I could hear what was going on in the front from where I was, which is why my heart sank when I heard this. Put your hands up. This is a robbery. I then hear a horrified scream, which I think was coming from the other customer that was in the store with me. You, don't move. Get up against the wall. I said, back to the wall now. That was a different voice. As far as I could tell, there were at least two men who were operating this. The entire store was suddenly silent. That's when I heard what seemed like the loudest gunshot I've ever heard. I literally had to cover my own mouth to prevent myself from gasping or screaming and tried to stay as quiet as possible. Open up the register and step away. I heard the familiar sound of a cash register opening and it was quiet for a few moments as I could only hear people shuffling around, which I assume was the guy hopping over the counter and unloading the register into a bag or something. After that, there was a quieter exchange between the first robber and the owner of the store. I couldn't hear it very clearly, but from what I could gather, the robber had asked to be taken to the vault or something like that. It seemed like the accomplice stayed back with the other customer, and the lights in the entire store had been turned off, possibly to make it look like they were closed from the outside. I thought about calling the police, but I was afraid that they would hear me given how quiet it was and how well sound seemed to travel in the store. My hands were shaking as I tried texting my roommate to ask him to send help, but I was cut short when I heard two pairs of footsteps headed in my direction. The 
This sent me into a panic since I had left a couple of items on the floor. The door to the dressing room was a thin swinging door with diagonal upward facing slots so that I could see out to the ceiling, but someone on the outside would only be able to see part of the floor if they tried to peek in. As quickly and quietly as possible, I gathered up everything from the floor and moved it onto the bench. I picked my feet up onto the bench and tried to squeeze myself into the corner. There is a small slot under the door, not enough to fit through, but enough that you could see if someone's feet were on the ground from the other side. I was able to see two pairs of shoes walk right past my door while I tried not to breathe. They seemed to go into the back somewhere, so I decided to finish my text message and hope that my roommate would notice and contact the police for me. This is before I knew that some call centers allow you to send a text message to 911 directly, which is now recommended for situations that are too dangerous to talk. I was so nervous as I waited for about 15 minutes while the owner and the robber were somewhere in the back. At no point during this experience was I ever comfortable, but there was a point where I kind of got used to the situation and my heart rate seemed to slow down a little bit. Then, out of nowhere, this came from the back of the store. Because this happened after several minutes of complete silence, I nearly had a heart attack when it happened and fell off the bench. I was praying that the other robber didn't hear that because I was convinced that the store owner was dead and I would be next if they found out about me. The robber then walked back past my changing room. Do it. No, please. I sat there in shock, thinking that I might be the lone survivor of this crime with any luck, but whatever hope I did have was dashed when I heard what he said next. Check the rest of the store. I didn't dare move a muscle as I heard the two men methodically taking apart the rest of the store. I thought back to when the store owner had let me into the changing room, how he had unlocked the door to let me go in. I thought maybe, just maybe, that they would assume that the doors are locked at all times and leave it be. But again, my head started burning when I saw a figure standing right outside my door through the slots, trying to peek inside. He tried the door handle and started loudly banging on the door. Anybody in there? Open up. He then starts throwing himself against the door like a madman. I can literally see the door breaking off its hinges before my eyes. It's not going to take much more abuse when, finally... I hear the guy yell out, let's go, and they both run for the exit. The rest of the night was pretty much a blur to me. I remember the police arriving, me being marched back through the store, seeing police and ambulance lights, seeing the bloody mess made along the wall, probably from that first customer. I was taken in for questioning. I probably wasn't very helpful, considering that I never saw their faces. As far as I know, neither of them were ever caught. It's pretty obvious to me why they decided to steal from a small costume shop just before Halloween, but I still wonder why they felt the need to kill especially someone in my position who didn't even see their faces. I've had many nightmares about the incident and have struggled to get the idea out of my head ever since. I've tried talking to therapists and friends about the situation and people have come up with their own theories. The best and probably most haunting theory that I've heard so far came from a witness who worked at a nearby restaurant and was getting off his shift around the time that I was in the costume store that night. After hearing about what happened in the news, he theorized that the two criminals didn't do it for the money, but rather did it for the thrill. I don't know if there's any truth to this, but he said he noticed two men in tuxedos walk into the shop wearing animal masks. Thanks for sticking around for our very first All Dainte Creepypasta. Special thanks to my two collaborators on this video. Sinister Stories was the narrator of The Scarecrow. She has her own creepypasta channel where she covers some fan favorites, so send some support her way. The music in this episode was created by a very small YouTuber, but also one of my favorites by the name of OST Maker. If you love really high quality scores and music compositions, Go check out the channel and subscribe, because OST Maker deserves a lot more recognition right now. That's going to do it for today. It looks like your bill comes out to $10.31. But if you like this video right now, I can waive that fee and you can have everything you just listened to absolutely free. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every other week, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming 
we both survive. <laughs>